Welcome to Storage Days, brought to you by Linbit and Shape Blue. Today we have Giles with us, who is the CEO and founder of Shape Blue. They are responsible for servicing and supporting Cloud Stack. Giles is has over 15 years of experience in cloud integration and support, and has um, is an active contributor to Cloud Stack. Giles, would you like to go ahead? Yeah, thank you, Brian. Good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody, wherever you are. Uh, thanks for the nice introduction, Brian. Although those those number of years get bigger every year, so it sort of uh, <laughs> makes me realise we only have a finite amount of time, right? Uh, so what we're going to be talking about today is just a, an overview and an introduction to Apache Cloud Stack. Uh, so if you've turned up to this uh, session expecting a huge technical deep dive, this isn't the right session for you. But the developer Q&A later is probably a, a better session. But what, what I want to do here is just explain a little bit about Apache Cloud Stack, where it fits, how it's implemented, what sort of technologies it integrates, who uses it, just to give you a flavor of the technology and also then you know where to go next in, time, in terms of uh, finding resources. Uh, as Brian said, I'm, I'm CEO of a company called Shape Blue. I'm going to talk just a little bit about Shape Blue in, in a second. But I also spend a, a percentage of my time acting as a committer and a, a PMC member of the Apache Cloud Stack project itself. In terms of agenda today, uh, as I say, I'm just going to talk quickly about Shape Blue as an organization, uh, talk about the you, you know, Cloud Stack, its use cases, where it fits, actually what it is and what it does. I'm going to run a quick demo, uh, a live demo of, of, of the Cloud Stack user interface. Then dive into the architecture a little bit, how it, it fits together with other things. Talk about the community, which is a, a really important aspect of an open source project like CloudStack. Give you some pointers in terms of where you can go for further reading. And then we should allow plenty of time for, for Q&A at the end. So just a, a little bit about my company, Shape Blue. Uh, I could read that to you there. We, we, we are basically a, a cloud integrator. We, we build uh, cloud environments for both service providers and enterprise customers. Uh, we focus almost solely these days on Apache Cloud Stack and therefore by definition on, on IaaS. And that's just, of course, we've been led down in terms of finding a technology that worked for our customers, finding a technology that could be implemented in sensible timeframes, for sensible budgets. So we've effectively become a, a vendor who puts a wrapper around CloudStack, which is uh, an open source technology. As a company, we've got offices in, in, in five different places. We're headquartered here in the UK. I'm speaking to you actually from home still in, in, in the UK. And just to show you some credentials that we are a real company who work with real clients. We work with all sorts of organizations. Uh, this first slide are predominantly service provider focused. Uh, some of these guys here are things like universities, TV companies, uh, some other organizations you may have heard of there. Uh, the only thing all of these people have got in common is that they all use uh, Apache Cloud Stack. And also some, some, we've got some pretty big names and some pretty significant infrastructures in there as well. So that's just a little bit about us as an organization. The rest of this talk is going to be about Apache Cloud Stack. So what is Cloud Stack? First of all, uh, I'm going to literally I'm going to read this. It's a scalable, multi-tenant, open source, purpose built cloud orchestration platform for delivering IaaS environments, IaaS clouds. Uh, but what I'm now going to do is just walk through each of those those things in bold uh, individually. First of all, scalable. Cloud Stack is uh, almost infinitely scalable. The biggest production deployment we've been involved in with Cloud Stack is thir over 35,000 physical hosts being orchestrated by Cloud Stack. It's designed to be multi tenant from the ground up. So the original use case for the design of Cloud Stack was around the service provider public cloud uh, use case. So intrinsically it's multi-tenant with with tenant isolation tenant separation it's open source uh, i'm talking today about apache cloud stack there is no such thing as shape blue cloud stack or any other cloud stack it's an apache project from the apache software foundation i am professionally as is the rest of my organization involved with that that open source project 
But what I'm talking about here today is a piece of tech that anybody on this webinar can go away and download afterwards, install free, free for you to use and start experimenting with. The use cases. Uh, so as I said, initially, uh, CloudSec was designed as a way for service providers to create public cloud environments for people to consume IaaS environments. Uh, but increasingly, we're seeing organizations want to do an internal thing, i.e. a private cloud thing, uh, but they want to leverage the, the tenants, the, the, the cornerstones of, of IaaS in terms of user self-service, in terms of isolation, in terms of metered use, etc. In a large enterprise organization, that fits with the model that, you know, IT is starting to become a commodity or has become a commodity within those organizations. And, you know, just to give you an indicator at Shape Blue, our customer base is roughly 50-50. Uh, and I would say that extrapolates out to CloudStack users generally, globally, roughly 50% of the organizations are using it. A service provider roughly are a, a non-service provider, so are using private cloud by definition. And obviously the combination of those two hybrid cloud is, is the logical conclusion for the, for the third use case. Just drill down in a bit, a bit of detail in terms of what it actually does and, and why it was created in the first place. And what I've got here are, are some building blocks. I, I, I first saw a diagram like this, you know, 12, 13 years ago, when this little company that sold books called Amazon popped up and said, hey, we're going to do a cloud computing thing. And we've launched this thing called the Elastic Compute Cloud, right, which is the ability to buy effectively instances uh, online. And the diagram they showed me then is still the same for IaaS. It pretty much looks like this. You know, you start with some networking, some compute, some storage in a data center. You would generally put a hypervisor over the top of it, although, you know, we've since looked into the concept of, uh, you know, of, of bare metal. A lot of people understand, we, you know, we have bare metal instances as well. Amazon then put a uh, what they called a CMP, a cloud management platform, or an orchestration layer on top of that. And back then, Amazon wrote their own thing, right? and they, they still maintain their own technology for doing that. Uh, that exposed an API, uh, and that API, in terms of public cloud, was then consumed by an e-commerce platform. Uh, Amazon already had an e-commerce platform because they were selling lots of books and CDs and things like that at, at the time. Uh, so in terms of people being able to replicate that sort of functionality, this is the way CloudStack looks at it, is that we've got some networking, some storage, and some compute, okay? And I'm not gonna go into too much detail uh, about those today, but let's just assume that the organization has network storage compute. Obviously, there is a particular type of storage because of uh, the nature of the, the webinar we're doing to, today that uh, we, were, we, we would say is a, a great storage to fit with CloudSat and it's got some great integration, that, that being the, the, the technology from Limbit. But from a, a CloudStack perspective, we're pretty agnostic in terms of, of what network storage and compute you've got. We then layer a hypervisor over the top. Uh, CloudStack supports, we say it's hypervisor agnostic because it supports pretty much any hypervisor you can think of. Uh, KVM, VMware, Zen, the new fork of Zen, which is getting a lot of traction, XCP, NG, Hyper-V, OVM. Uh, you can choose any of these hypervisors. Uh, you can mix and match these hypervisors in, in, in your environment. So CloudStack's putting an abstraction layer away from that. CloudStack is the actual uh, orchestrator itself. It does the job of the, the, the cloud management uh, layer. It presents a REST API. It also has its own user interface, which I'm gonna, gonna show you later today. And that's pretty much all CloudStack does, okay? <laughs> it's a very complex product to do that because if you think of the infinite number of permutations of hypervisor of network of compute and storage, uh, it has a lot of work to do, but in, in terms of the function it, it performs is to pull all those green blocks together, orchestrate them and present them as an easily consumable API or an easily consumable UI. Uh, it also has some other sort of extensions. We've got a thing called the CloudStack Kubernetes service. I'll talk about that in a bit more detail in a second. We have a command line tool called Cloud Monkey, but then people start layering in other things. So if you're doing public cloud, people would normally still integrate CloudStack with an existing e-commerce platform, uh, Kubernetes itself through the Kubernetes service. 
different developer tooling, automation tooling, uh, multi-cloud management tools. But CloudStack is providing that glue in the, in the middle and providing the abstraction between the infrastructure and the, the physical infrastructure and the hypervisor and the things that want to consume and, and automate that. In terms of the people that actually use CloudStack, I showed you a load of our customers earlier, they're all using CloudStack, but there's loads of other organizations. Uh, these aren't, some of these are our customers, some of them aren't our customers. Lots of different types of organizations around the world use Apache CloudStack. Uh, one of the things being an Apache project is that we, <laughs> we're not great at tracking usage. It's one of the tenants of the Apache Software Foundation that we give software away. We, we, we don't make people register for that software. So what we also have is a whole bunch of people who we know are using CloudStack who don't talk publicly about it. But some of the world's largest organizations, a number of the world's top 10 largest organizations work with Apache CloudStack. Just look in a bit more detail, uh, the advantages of, of, of CloudStack. And one, one of the, the reasons people get drawn to it over other similar technologies, right, let, let's get it out there. You know, we have, there's other technologies out there like OpenStack, for example, Open Nebula, Open Source. You've got VM, VMware, vCloud Direct. So they all do very similar things. One of the advantages that CloudStack has is that it is an integrated end-to-end -end IaaS product. Unlike, for example, OpenStack, which is a collection of loosely coupled, I don't know how many now, 34 projects, uh, each one is effectively providing a discrete service. Now, now, there are advantages with that model. CloudStack is an integrated product for delivering most of what most organizations want from an IaaS layer. It's proven at scale uh, because of one and the, the first two points there, we can deploy CloudStack really quickly. It can be operational. To put this in perspective, a POC with CloudStack is a, a day's time frame, not a month's time frame. A production deployment of CloudStack is a week's time frame, not a year's time frame. Uh, it's a relatively easy, low cost uh, technology to operate and manage. Uh, it's truly multi tenant from the ground up. We have the the nice warm feeling we get that the, the development community is backed by and governed by the Apache Software Foundation, and it is predominantly a user-led community, which is really interesting. Um, you know, a lot of open source projects, particularly when they're at the top of the hype curve, take Kubernetes as an example, which is a fantastic uh, collection of projects. Uh, but a lot of the contributions coming in there now are coming in from vendors who all see that technology as a route to market. Uh, I don't want to criticize Kubernetes, by the way, but we're involved in that as well. But uh, you, you, you start to get almost an imbalance. You get too many vendors involved in a project. CloudStack is effectively a user driven community. So the people com contributing to CloudStack are predominantly users of the software. So they're big service providers, large enterprises, and that gives CloudStack this sort of organic feel as a piece of software. And it removes the risk that a vendor or a group of vendors are gonna try and push the technology in a, in a, in a different direction. Uh, it's got a relatively narrow scope. I showed you the diagram earlier. What CloudStack doesn't try and do is replace your block storage. We integrate with people like Limbit, for example, and other providers. Uh, what it doesn't try and do is, you know, re change, force you to change your hypervisor model or anything like that. We, we keep quite a narrow scope. And finally, yes, it's free, it's open source. I think everybody's probably got that by now. In terms of functionality, it obviously enables self-service. That's the whole point of IaaS, and that can be done through a web UI. We have a command line, a REST API. Uh, very broad hypervisor support. We support Kubernetes clusters as well. CloudStack has a enterprise grade virtual networking model, which allows consumers or users of your cloud to build quite complex networking models. Uh, so they could build a multi-layer, what we call a virtual private cloud. Uh, they can control the, you know, the firewall, the ingress, the egress, the load balancing, all of that through the, the self-service interface. As I mentioned before, largest uh, production environment we've seen is 35,000 physical hosts, or well, actually just, just north of that. Uh, and it also provides a high availability model on top of the hypervisor itself. 
Specifically, uh, we have a, an integration point we call the CloudSat Kubernetes service, and this allows organizations to ease the challenges of deploying Kubernetes clusters. So if you are a public cloud provider, for example, and you need to offer a, Q, a, a container as a service offering, or rather it's almost a, a Kubernetes as a service offering, you can do that out of the box with CloudStack. You don't have to do anything else. And CloudStack orchestrates and automates the creation of the clusters, the installation of Kubernetes, the configuration of the clusters, and then can do some quite neat things like ha ha handling sort of auto scaling out of the Kubernetes uh, world uh, and a number of other things. And, you know, there, there is uh some movement at the moment towards people pro creating what are called capi providers for for kubernetes and that's something that we're looking at from the from the the cloud stack perspective this effectively is the integration the other way around so hopefully that just gives you a, a feel of what cloud stack's all about i'm just going to jump in and do a, a very quick uh demo hoping that the the demo gods are with me uh so let me just give me a second This one on here. Okay, so this is just a, a vanilla uh, CloudStack uh, user interface. Most organizations will customize this and it's a very uh, customizable uh, UI. I'm just going to log in as a plain user. Okay, so what I'm seeing here is just an overall view of. of, of uh, of what I've got in terms of uh, compute, virtual machines, in terms of uh, data volumes, and in terms of, of networks. And I can explore the menu on the left-hand side, instances, I can look at my Kubernetes clusters, I can create groups of instances. I won't go through everything here. I can then look at what storage volumes I've got. I can also use CloudStack for taking snapshots. Uh, I can then use it to create quite complex networks. We've got a number of different networking models we can use. And then we've got the, the concept of templates and, and images, uh, which allow me to create standardized templates to base new virtual machines on. What I'm going to do, I'm just going to drill down and quickly show you the idea of an instance. So I've got a, uh, I've got a machine here is my database SQL 01. Uh, get some background information on this. I can do all sorts of things like, for example, I can I can go and uh, look at its console. It says. So I can actually get direct console access through to the through to the, the, the virtual machine. I can start, I can stop it, I can take a snapshot of it and then I can also sort of configure that machine. If I wanted to uh, launch a new instance, very, very easy process. It's, it's all in one place. I choose add instance. Uh, I choose what zone I want to deploy that into. I'm gonna talk about these constructs in a second. What template I want to base that instance on. I've just got one here. This is just a, 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 a raw uh, test dev environment I, I have uh, here, but I can have any number of templates, both. Uh, community-based templates, mine or shared templates across the, the whole environment. And those could be templates which are obviously configured into different, use different hypervisors, different uh, OSs, different bits of pre-installed software, etc. I can then drop through, choose how big I want that virtual machine to, to be, how many uh, vCPUs, how much memory. You know, all of this stuff in terms of templates, in terms of offerings, is all configured by the admin of the environment. So as a service provider, you put a lot of thought into what size instances you're going to sell, how much you're going to charge for them, and, and that's where this list uh, is, is created. So these could be labeled as anything, gold, silver, bronze, small, medium, large, micro, whatever you want. I'm just going to go with the small one for the moment. Uh, I can, as well as the root disk, I can choose to add a, uh, a secondary data disk uh, to this. And then I can go and choose what network I want to attach it to. I can even go and create a new network at this stage. I'm just going to take the, the quickest option because of time. Okay. And finally, I could choose SSH key pairs for getting onto the machine, etc. Uh, I'll just give it a name, uh, demo02. 
specify I want it to start. And off we go. Oh, valid name because I used a space in a machine name. Okay, so off it goes. Now, Cloud Stack is going off and queuing up the orchestration commands that are required to make that happen. So, a lot of this in this case is speaking to the hypervisor. I think this is VMware underneath here, could be KVM, could be anything uh, to go and create that. It will be speaking to storage, it will be speaking to network to go and create the components that are required to put this machine on the network that I've specified or to create the new network that I'd specified if I'd done that at the time. Okay, uh, it's not an instant thing. Uh, it de depends on the size of your environment, but you can see this is starting. And actually, if I'm quick, I should be able to go into the console and actually see it booting. Uh, there we go, just waiting for its driver initialization. Okay, so that's a ve the very, you know, that's the very, it's not even 101, that's just the one of, of, of cloud stack. That's the very, very basic uh, use case, which is to be able to create and manage virtual instances. But remember, I'm doing that through an abstracted user interface, or I can do it through an, an abstracted uh, API. We just uh, come back to this. So I show people the user interface because it's something nice to look at and you can visualize these things. But most of the interactions that operators have or users have with CloudStack is normally through its REST API because this is where the power really comes in. Uh, everything I've just shown you in the user interface and all of the other 99% of things that I didn't show you are all available through our REST API. So, you know, a couple of examples there. I can list uh, all my VMs, templates, create a new network, create a new virtual machine attached to that network. And the power of this really comes in is when you start to consume that UI in scripting environments, in config management environments like Ansible, Puppet, etc. Because what that lets me do, I'm going to go just through the user ones first of all. What that lets me do is build quite complex environments based on, for example, you know, a pair of database servers, a pair of app servers, a pair of load balance web servers at the front with some quite complex networking rules in between effectively you've got you've got you know my my, my my three tiers there i can stand all of that up through a script i could then run some tests against that environment and then i could tear it down again so that's one of our great use cases is r d and test environments but if you are a large enterprise uh and you have to consume regularly you know environments like an app development environment or something like that okay that sort of level of automation starts to just save save person hours okay so that's one of the other private cloud uh use cases uh automated deployment of production baseline environments we've we've got uh, a very large customer in germany who are a uh, a very large sap consultancy and reseller and you know they're in, they're installing doing sap installations you know dozens per day because they're such a large organization and they have a, a standard deployment of those they use cloud stack to be able to do that in seconds instead of what would have taken them days to do previously so it's that level of automation and recreatability that the, some of the advantages we we can get with cloud stack uh, automated deployment of dr environments triggering things if certain events happen uh sitting underneath cicd pipelines uh and then from an operator perspective uh they can use the api for you know for billing integration into cloud stack creating custom user portals all, all of that sort of stuff as well as an api uh, we've also got a command line tool we call it cloud monkey uh, and that's simply a wrapper to the to the rest api i, I just showed you there so hopefully that's just giving you a flavor of, of what CloudStack does. Uh, I'm just going to talk about uh, the architecture and effectively what it will and sort of won't work with uh, quickly now. So first of all, from the virtualization perspective, uh, that's what we support, uh, which is a pretty exhaustive list. Yes, I know there are some other hypervisors out there in specific use cases, secure gov and stuff like that. 
Uh, but we cover, we think, 99.9% .9 of the hypervisor deployments globally. Now, one of the interesting things about this, and actually one of the strange recent use cases we've seen with CloudStack, is if, if organizations are automating into those hypervisors, if they do it directly into that hypervisor, that's creating a dependency in their organization. So, for example, if you have an organization that is predominantly a VMware or 100% VMware organization, and they st then start to automate their CIDC, CICD pipeline on top of that directly into the VMware API, they're creating a very tight coupling to that vendor and to that, uh, or to, to that virtualization platform. If you put something like CloudStack on top of that, you've created a, effectively a, an agnostic, a hypervisor independent API because you want to create a virtual machine, you call our API and say, create a virtual machine. And the end user doesn't even need to know what hypervisor that's being stood up on. And this is a use case we see at the moment, people who are intending on moving between their, their virtualization estate from one vendor to another, put CloudStack over the top first, so they don't have to get those deep integration points into the, the hypervisor. We then have to choose our what we call our primary storage CloudStack primary storage is effectively where the uh, where the virtual machines live. Uh, CloudStack basically supports anything because it supports iSCSI or, or NF, NFS or, or fiber channel or local disk. Uh, but it's worth mentioning that we also have some special cases, uh, and that's one of the reasons we're here today. Uh, we have a number of technologies that we have we call managed storage, and they have much deeper integration than just using NFS with CloudStack. And that's some of the stuff uh, I know you probably heard about the, Cloud, the CloudStack Limbit integration yesterday. I think they were, the guys were talking about it. That work has enabled Limbit's technology to become managed storage underneath CloudStack. And that lets us do things like have much more granular control over that storage from the, from the orchestration viewpoint. CloudStack also has a concept of secondary storage. This is where we put our, our low grade artifacts, the stuff that we don't need high performance for. So things like images, uh, templates, uh, snapshots, things that we don't need that higher performance that we would do for, for a virtual machine. And this can be much cheaper, lower grade storage. Most people use NFS, although we do support Swift, ironically, uh, and we can also back that storage out to S3 as well. CloudStack has a number of constructs uh, to allow you to, to organize it as it scales, because, you know, as I mentioned before, the largest environment we've ever been involved with was 35,000 physical hosts. You can just think of the number of VMs that were involved there, you can just think of the number of different data centers that, that, that were involved there and just the sheer size of the underlying infrastructure. So we've got these constructs uh, in CloudStack. The top level we have is a region uh, and that's effectively an, administra an administrative uh, concept. So, so that just lets us organize. And the classic example is re at literally a region, US, you know, North America, Europe, Asia, what, what have you. A zone, uh, a zone is defined uh, as having uh, basically normally maps to a, to, a, to a data center. It doesn't have to map to a data center, but it makes logical sense because all of the infrastructure is contained at zone level, not, not at region level. Inside a zone, we can have any number of pods and a pod is normally, uh, normally a rack in a data center uh, because a pod has a number of clusters, a number of, of, of virtualization clusters, and it also has primary and secondary storage attached to it. And we then can have multiple clusters in that pod and each cluster is a different hypervisor. Okay, And again, all of this can be completely abstracted from the user uh, or it can be presented to the user. So, you know, some of our large service, international service provider customers they have literally these regions, uh, North America, Europe, Asia Pac, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they have zones which are, you know, uh, Tokyo South, something else, and the, literally data centers. Uh, they normally wouldn't expose a pod out to the, to the end user, but then clusters, they, they might have just have different virtualization technologies and that sort of thing. 
So key thing there is we've got a number of, sort of scalable constructs in, in cloud stack. In terms of you know what it does as a technology, I, I'm not going to go through all of these boxes, but pretty much everything I've been talking about, you, you can see there, we've got a user interface, we're doing obviously workload management, we've got custom templates, that sort of thing. The key takeaway from this is that all of these things are done by CloudStack as a product. Okay, CloudStack as a product, its its main brain is in a thing called the management server, and the management server pretty much does everything you see there, with a, a, a couple of uh, uh, exceptions, and that's what makes it easy to deploy, lower cost to manage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In terms of how we deploy it. Uh, up to up to a few thousand physical hosts, we literally drop in uh, to the environment a CloudStack management server. You can see that there over on the left. I think I highlight it here. Uh, that has a uh, MySQL database with a couple of different MySQL databases that sit behind it. And what that management server is then doing is communicating through the hypervisor layer with the physical hosts, with the networking components, uh, and, and with, with the storage. So it's just an orchestration layer. And one thing to get over to people in, in terms of uh, proving this, if you like, you could have a very large cloud stack environment and literally unplug the management server and the whole environment will still run. Obviously, you, you would have lost the ability to carry on orchestrating and to deploy new pieces of infrastructure and what have you, but the existing infrastructure is then just effectively virtualized infrastructure on your network storage and computes. Uh, and then there's a couple of exceptions for, for its virtual networking model. CloudStack deploys a, a component it calls a virtual router. So for every network we create, it will spin up a virtual router that belongs to that guest account. Uh, and that does the routing. That's what allows that, 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 uh, that user to configure their firewall, to configure their load balancing, that's all done through this virtual appliance. And unfortunately, I haven't got this on, on the diagram, but our, our user interface is, is a separate component as well. So that sits now on, on top of the management server. Okay, one of the most important things, I think, you know, I mentioned this earlier, is, is CloudStack is an open source community driven uh, project. And that brings huge benefits to, to, to the users of the software. It's developed by a community, and that community is run on predominantly mailing lists, but there's Slack channels and, and other, other forms of communication as well. And the governance model for that project is provided by the Apache Software Foundation. So that's why we have to refer to this as Apache Cloud Stack, not just Cloud Stack. Uh, I'm sure everybody's heard of, of Apache Software Foundation. Obviously, you know, the people behind web server, Hadoop, Cassandra, you, you, you name it. Yeah, hundreds and hundreds of very, very successful projects. And the key thing with Apache projects is they tend to be around for the long term. OK, they tend to be very organic, long term pieces of software, more so than some of the open source uh, foundations. And the reason for that is that the governance model of Apache prohibits vendors or organizations from taking control of a project. And it's very, very strong. You can't, as a sponsor or a vendor, you can't buy a seat and influence the governance of the project. The governance of the project is controlled by a number of volunteers who are PMC members or committers. I happen to be both of those things. Uh, and it has a very strong set of laws and bylaws about voting techniques and methods, et cetera, et cetera. And what that means is we end up with software that, as I say, is very organic and has a very long term footprint because people are confident that it's not going to get dragged in any crazy directions by a vendor or, or a group of vendor vendors. Uh, the project at the moment is doing that, is doing two re releases a year. Uh, occasionally there's an interim release, but that's the plan as it stands at the moment. We also have a, an LTS uh, uh, cycle, which provides support for releases uh, for, for, for two years. Uh, and it is a, you know, it's a very diverse user driven community. It's, it's not a community that is, uh, is overwhelmed with vendors. Obviously, you know, 
people like the guys from Limbit have, have just done their integration with CloudStack. So they've been involved as, as community members in, in doing that. But this is not a project that is driven just by those vendors. It's overwhelmingly driven by the people who actually use the software. So to that extent, there was a question with regards to that. What um, what is Shape Blue's involvement in development of CloudStack? Um, do you have an idea of how much you contribute versus other people in the community? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, there's two answers. There's the official answer I must give to that, and there's also the uh, the, the 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 answer that the attendee wants to hear. Right? Quite an important concept is. A, with Apache, organizations aren't represented. And that's a, that's a very, organizations can sponsor the ASF, but you can't represent yourself in a project. So when I'm working, though I'm CEO of a reasonable sized cloud integrator, when I'm working in Apache CloudStack, I'm doing so as Giles, not as, not as ShapeBlue, okay? And that's a key tenant of Apache projects. And that's one of the things that stops organizations getting that control. And there's no no sense that we can we can buy influence. Literally, you know, anybody who has been in the community for a while, any other uh, committer could veto a vote on something that everybody else thinks is is uh, is is a good thing. And that model of consensus is what gives that gives us that balance. That's the formal answer. The informal answer, I think informally, and it is, it is actually, there is no absolute on this. I think clouds, I think Shape Blue is, amongst our team, is the biggest organizational uh, contributor, uh, I would say so. We probably contribute roughly 40, 50% of the effort that goes into CloudStack uh, because, you know, we are the only organization out there who is just focusing on, on, on this technology. But one of the things we, as are, as we've grown as an organization, obviously that percentage has gone up and got to where it is. Uh, one of the things as an organization we've tried really, really hard to do is not to pick up, start acting like a vendor. We completely get the open source model. Our customers don't buy software from us. They take the same as, as, as everybody else. But yeah, I'd say 40, 50% is, is about where we're at. Uh, Brian, do you want to, should we do that other question at the same time? It's probably a good time. Um, oh, no, sure. Yeah, the, the other question was, um, what is your opinion of OpenStack and how does CloudStack compare to it? Um, that's obviously yeah. a personal opinion, but yeah. we'd that's, love to that, hear your that, opinion. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a two hour talk all in itself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and you can hear me see any of the recordings of me doing talks at conferences over the years. You, you'll hear that question always comes up. Uh, very quick summary both started with similar ideas okay in terms of ios but it was about what the vision was for those things and openstack's vision which was once once it was over just the nasa stuff and it, it started to become with the you know the the big vendor players their vision was we create this all-encompassing cloud operating system for for the rest of the world right and and we all know that there was some commercial stuff about VMware and, and what have you. And it had this huge ambition and has now turned into this massive foundation with 30, 40 projects all in itself. CloudStack was just effectively a piece of software, happened to do the same thing as that vision and did it as a piece of software, right? Uh, now, going back 10 years, eight years probably, the analyst community and the media loved that two horse race of which one's going to win. And certainly, yeah, I get it. OpenStack got all the hype. Uh, but we were there waving, saying, hey, we've just won this customer. We've just done that. Because actually, people who were really doing this back then were coming to CloudStack and they were deploying it in a few weeks or a few months, not in a few years, and have now been quietly trading and running some of the world's largest public clouds on it. So you know, where we've got to now is this huge foundation of all these different interconnected projects, which is called OpenStack, versus this one project of Apache called CloudStack, which you can install and do what you want for, a, for an IaaS perspective. I hope that answers the question. Uh, as I say, there's, a, there's another hour and a half of, of, of background to that, but I'm sure we haven't got time for that today, Brian. Uh, so the, 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 just going back to the slides here, project today, 
just over 200 committers in the project. The, the PMC, which is like the management committee, is made up from people from a whole range of, of, of organizations. And just to give you some metrics, this was up until yesterday. Uh, in the last four weeks, you know, five, nearly 600 mailing list messages from 70 different contributors, 108 merge PRs. You can go and look at GitHub, uh, go and look at the project on GitHub and see these same numbers if you want from 39 different authors, uh, around 1600 package downloads of, of Apache Cloud Stack. So as a project, we're a vibrant, busy project uh, with a lot of development, a lot of new functionality coming out, uh, represented, you know, the, the development community is represented from people from all sorts of different organizations. Uh, now, I will openly admit that this next slide is, is horribly out of date <laughs> and I maybe should have taken it out, but until until the spring of last year, we used to do loads of meetups and events. Uh, that they, we still do meetups and events. They don't look anything like that at the moment, although I'm hoping to see those come back next year. Uh, Generally, you know, there's a, there's a couple of different things. There's lots of different user groups, uh, hacker groups, that focus around CloudSight in all sorts of different, uh, or user groups focus in, in all sorts of different parts of the world, right? So I'm involved in one called the CloudSight European user group. There is also a, a separate user group, which is the German user group. There's a San Francisco Bay Area user group who, who, who meet up. Uh, these tend to be sort of ad hoc. There's nothing formal about them. Uh, they're just a bunch of people who are interested in, in the technology. But much more formally, every year we have a conference for our technology. Uh, it has its own website, cloudstackcolab.org. Uh, last time we physically got together was in Las Vegas in, oh, seems a long time ago. Oh autumn fall of 2019 we haven't been allowed to go anywhere since then but we're actually doing uh our first virtual conference 8th to the 10th of november this year so that's coming up in in a little over a month uh that's free to register if anybody's interested i think there's 30 something technical talks there's a lot of vendor talks going on there's some uh great workshops there's a hackathon uh so if anybody's got some uh some spare time please register and, and come come along and, and, and learn more about cloud stack where to go next in terms of further resources uh you can download cloud stack and start playing with it uh you can get the uh get the uh product from uh, download.cloudstack.org or shape blue my company provider effectively a, a, a mirror of that uh the project website is there uh, there's a link to the documentation. We'll share all of these links and slides afterwards. Uh, if you want to get involved, want to start asking some questions, maybe you hit a few problems, uh, the place to start is the CloudStack mailing lists, uh, which are quite an old fashioned thing that, that Apache insists on having their email based lists. But join the user's mailing list, say, hi, I've just installed CloudStack this is happening or I've got some questions and you'll get people from all of the organizations I showed you logos of earlier say offering to help you they're generally a friendly bunch it's a, it's a, it's a friendly community uh, as I mentioned we've got the collab conference uh, that's worth attending or the class that European user group uh, both of those entities if you like are virtual at the moment we're all hoping come next year that we can all finally get back on some planes and in our cars and, and actually go and meet each other for some of these things. Uh, that is pretty much it from me. We've had some questions. Uh, any more to come, Brian? Um, looks like the only one is how do we register for the event, um, which I think, as you stated, we'll send out links after. But if you want to plug the event registration site, we should do yes. that cloudstackcolab.org there's a should be a registration button right on the front of that uh which takes you through to the event platform and, and you register from there okay perfect well it doesn't appear that we have any more questions so thank you all for attending and